Very good morning and happy Sabbath. It's interesting that I've been asked to um, preach on the topic that is typically quite um, useful in the month of uh, January. And this being the, almost the end of the month of January, 29. So I am just uh, wondering if I have slides, if not. The title of this sermon is A New Beginning. Okay, got it. And the subtitle is um, Becoming and Staying Renewed. I'm just wondering, uh, since it's January and, uh, you know, it's New Year, right? How many of you made resolutions? How many of you made resolutions? Okay, a few. All right, so I'm getting this clicker to resolve to move. Okay, New Year's resolutions. So I wanted to check, like, um, once more, how many of you made a New Year's resolution? Okay, all right. How many of you made a resolution not to make resolution? So did you keep it? Yeah, so I, I thought this sermon, uh, there'll be a little bit of psychology, a little bit. Uh, some references to what other people are talking about, particularly in New Beginnings. But I thought, you know, mash it with some practical theology. Practical as in like you can apply it in your lives, all right? So... These are some uh, findings that have been shared. So for, I wanted to find out in, within this live audience, how many of you had actually made resolutions? Well, about a quarter. So someone came out with this and then they polled. It was found out about a quarter of people will make at least one New Year's resolution. <laughs> and here's the thing, a vast majority will not keep them. So why make them, right? So, so let's look at the quarter who made. There must be a reason why they did. And I want to encourage, for those of you who put up your hand, I want to encourage you to keep at it. I will share with you a secret how to keep it. And then we will apply it to our topic for today. All right? There is a concept that's called fresh start effect. And what it means, it says that people are more likely to take action towards a goal after temporal landmarks. So landmarks, milestones in your calendar, in your life, okay, that represent new beginnings. So for example, New Year's Day, Chinese New Year, maybe not, birthday or anniversary. So they say that you would be more likely to succeed if you connect that kind of uh, resolution right to a new beginning, something that represents a new beginning, okay? And here's the good news. 35% of people who make resolutions actually manage to stick to all. I don't know how many they, they make, I mean, but they found that 35% could keep all of their goals. Fantastic, right? So that's a lot. Now, if you are a mathematician, and then you find that a quarter of the people, so 35% of a quarter, maybe about 8% of any population who had, you know, resolved, they actually kept all of their goals. Fantastic, right? And then half of them actually kept some. So not so bad. So overall, the picture is not like we always joke, resolution, resolution, you're bound to break them. But here's another secret. So I thought it good to be shared that um, there are two kinds of goals they discovered. One, avoidance goal, which means you quit something, that you're doing something you don't like, and then you say you quit it. Or an approach goal. An approach goal is 
adopting a new habit, starting a new practice. Now, just general psychology, if I were to ask you know, the congregation here, what do you think would be a more effective goal to keep or to make? Is it an avoidance goal or is it an approach? Thank you. Okay, let me get back there, right? So people are 25% more likely to meet their approach goals rather than avoidance goals. So if you are those who are making resolutions or, you know, you're trying, so here's the hint. The hint is that instead of stopping things, resolving to stop something, you should start doing new things. Chances of uh, keeping it will be higher, okay? So now, what, what has all this uh, general psychology topics got to do with what we're going to talk about? Well, I thought the focus uh, is very, very relevant and apt when we compare that here's a verse that perhaps some of us here are familiar, have heard about it, but perhaps this is something that you don't want to visit too much because it reminds you of certain things, right? So, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And sometimes you may have heard it being quoted to you, being uh, reminded of you that you are a new creation because the old has passed away and the new has come. But honestly, uh, it bothers me and uh, it could perhaps also bother you to find that maybe um, no change. Right? So, so what is new? What is the new? And what is the old that has passed away? And sometimes it feels a little bit uh, depressing when you are reminded, hey, you are a new creature. Why are you doing things in this manner? And it irks you. I don't know about you, but it irks me. Right? Um, if you have already been a Christ follower for some time, and it keeps bugging you, right? So what has changed? What is it? So let's look at a few uh, Bible verses. And then we will help it all together. Remember our general psychology uh, principles that we had in the beginning. And let's merge them together and see what we can get, all right? So if you take that context of what has passed away, what has come then Galatians 2.20 is a good reminder. All right, it says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So technically, technically, you see some keywords here, crucified, you see Christ, of course. You see, I no longer live. And there is someone else who lives now. So technically, there has been a death. And that death crucified on the cross. Right? According to uh, the Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter, it is us, right, taking on that. New identity. So we have been crucified with Christ, but it is no longer I who live. 
But it's interesting, right? Because if you look at the context of dancing, our daily life, our daily practice, uh, is not so easy, right? I'm just wondering, and I, I'm uh, taking the risk here. You don't have to answer me, but I'm going to ask anyway. And that is, how many of you never got angry after you accepted Christ? Never. Once. Never. Uh, no one there to put up their hand, huh? Okay. Your eyebrow, you just raise your eyebrow. No one there. Because if you do that, then I'll say, uh, maybe you forgot about lying. Huh? <laughs> so, so what has happened? Where, where is, is this verse even true? I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. So the life I live now in the flesh, then it's not me, then who? Right? So Paul reminds us, it is Christ who lives in me. And there's a description of this new life, and this new life I live by faith. And we know, by faith, by definition, faith is believing in something you cannot see. So we humans, we like to see things, touch things before we believe. So here it's about walking by faith and believing, hey, I have died with Christ. I've been crucified in that sense. But then why am I behaving like this? Okay, so maybe we, we, we you know, go a bit further. Because here is linking with what Christ actually said as a call to his disciples. And he says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Take up our cross daily and follow me. We're going to build on that idea of daily very shortly as a clue as to how we get to keep, right, when we resolve something, all right? So if any person will come after Christ, let them deny themselves, take up their crosses daily, and follow Christ. Okay, so with here then, we have to have a discussion about the problem of sin. Because the struggle that I talked about earlier, that, hey, I'm supposed to be a new creature, but I don't behave like one. Why? It has to do with this whole problem of sin. So here's some theology. So give some theology and later I'll add the practical part of it, alright? So uh, I put off a chart here, a table, and this table is a very rudimentary form of explaining what the problem of sin, the impact, and the solution is all about. Right? So in this table, three columns. Uh, leftmost column, we're going to describe about the aspect of the problem of sin. The middle column describes the time dimension in which this aspect uh, plays. And the most important of all, the column, is God's solution. So let's look at the first aspect of sin, which is penalty. Now, sin demands a penalty. By itself, by its nature, it demands a penalty because the consequence is death. And the death that we know is death is eternal separation from God. Right? So, so we are all condemned to it. We are all born sinful. Can't deny it. Can't escape it. So it's almost like because of sin's presence in the world, then whoever is born, even a baby born innocent, has to deal, has to contend with the concept of sin. And the first part of it is the aspect of the penalty of death. Now, the time dimension actually, with regards to God's plan, all right, for our sake, then the time dimension is actually in the past. So if we, if we were to say, hey, that's a problem, but let me tell you something else. The problem has been taken care of. God's solution is paid by Jesus on the cross. So the past dimension, all right, so the aspect of the penalty of sin belongs to the dimension of the past. It is already settled. 
it is already paid for. Right? Nothing you can do to add to that. Nor subtract. Okay? So, this is the beautiful part, I believe, of uh, a, a faith that is by Christ and we believe in that. Is that nothing you can do to subtract what Christ has already done. It's already paid for, okay, people? And nothing you can do to add. So we don't need any more uh, saviors. Nothing else that you can do to make you safe. No need already. All right? So let's go to the present dimension, which is the problem dimension, which is why I put in a red color. Right? Because here we are faced with an aspect of the problem of sin, which is the power of sin. And that's where we place it, perhaps, um, in the metaphor of a battle. There is a battle going on. And the battle is for your soul. Right? And it's in the present. So what is God's solution? Right? The penalty has already been taken care of, but the, the power of it that we contend with every day, every waking moment, and that solution is the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. In the Greek, is known as a name called parakletos. This means one who is called to your side. Para is in parallel. Para, slide. Kletos, from the uh, verb to call. Holy Spirit is one called to be by your side. And in fact, if you look at the Jesus uh, uh, birth story where, where God is pronounced as Emmanuel. God is with us. The same idea that God has always longed to be with us and He wants us to be with Him. And knowing this dimension that we are in, contending with the power of sin, we struggle with our choices, with all that, Holy Spirit is called to our side. His presence, omnipresence, is by the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit. So that is the dimension that we are in. And if we talk about the presence of sin, one day, one day it will be totally removed. Totally removed. And that is in the future. Right? So what has it got to do with us? A lot of things got to do with us. <laughs> Why? Because it's right in the middle, in the present time, right, that we talk about, hey, we are caught in a battle for our soul. Now, here is it. We may not realize it, or we may realize it and say, well, we can't do anything, all right? So, so why am I struggling? Okay, firstly, you must know that you're not struggling. There's no need for you to struggle to be saved already. You are saved already. So now we make that choice to, be, to want to be with God. And that's where, you know, we hear verses like this. Paul writing to the church in Corinth says this, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. Why outwardly? Because that's our shell, that's our flesh. This flesh will die. Right? Yet inwardly we are being renewed, and once more, day by day. Renewed day by day. It is our spirit, right? In the present, accompanied by the Holy Spirit, that we get our renewal, right? I mean, we, we look at ourselves, we look at our bodies and say, well, how, why, how come I cannot do this? You know, I, I used to play soccer with the guys. Remember James and all that, right? Now I, I can only see people play and feel the stirring of playing, but will not make the mistake anymore of trying to play. Because um, I've been banned from playing soccer for the rest of my life. Uh, by my beloved wife, Adeline. She's like, you play. So, outwardly, we, we want it, but we don't. But there will be a day when our flesh will be incorruptible. And that day is coming. That day is coming. You don't have to worry about balding hair, falling teeth. No more. 
we are going to have incorruptibility right with us and our spirit will be renewed. But from the, the spirit point of view, we can have renewal day by day. All right? And I love this, which is our scripture, and I love this. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So we're going to go a bit deeper into what does it mean. There's a common thread so far, right? Daily. Day by day. Every morning. So I'm getting there. But here, here's the thing. God's compassions never fail. Never fail. They are new every morning. Fantastic, right? You wake up in the morning, it's new. Yeah, God has been there. All right? And so that new thing, how does it happen? Is this. A reminder again, the letter to Romans. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. The mind. The mind is where it takes place, right? Then, by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, His good, acceptable, and perfect will. Romans 12. So the renewal of the mind. Let's piece all these together. The renewal of the mind. The presence of the Holy Spirit. The never-failing compassions of God. When? Every day. When? New. Every morning. So I'm getting there. All right, with the idea of how do we keep that resolution. Right? And I wanted to uh, share with you the story of two of my friends. Uh, this was taken... Um, yeah, it was featured uh, a few weeks ago. And this is somebody who's called Jix. Nice name, Jix. When I first met him, he's actually my um, adult uh, training um, mentor, right? I didn't know about his story until later on. Uh, we shared, and I said, wow. So what is his story? He was addicted to heroin um, at the age of about 12, 13. And it was like about a seven-year addiction that he struggled with and had to go for rehab and all that. But uh, it's fantastic because he has then produced a book that's called Chasing the Dragon Out. Nice title. Chasing the Dragon, metaphor for taking heroin, but out, chasing it out. And if you, uh, you know, can Google it, then you'll find that in the Straits Times, it was featured on January the 9th, on a Sunday. He wrote the uh, uh, guest column. But in the middle of that article, he says this. The heroin addiction that he had was a very tough one because as a teenager. But as he struggled with the withdrawal, he came through it. The hard part was staying quit. Right? It's difficult to quit, but staying quit was hard. And he linked it to the word volition or the will. It's a daily battle. And, um, you know, if you can, I'm not publicizing his book, but his book is uh, very uh, simply written talks about struggle, talks about how he then focuses, right, from someone who couldn't, he only had uh, primary six living examination, but he went on in his journey to get master's. And that was from the concept of knowing that you will, putting forth the will. Now, the will, it's a very, very hard thing. It seems like it's a difficult thing for some people depending on circumstance, depending on what they have been afflicted with. But here's the thing. Along the way, okay, he didn't mention this in the article, but along the way, with a belief in God, the connection to the Spirit of God, there is a way. But you must first start with your will. 
Romans 8 reminds me that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Nothing. And if you look at the whole Romans 8, you realize, yes, it's true. Not even supernatural things can separate us from the love of God except one thing. What's that one thing? Our will. We start with that will first. It's a tough journey. And yet another one, my friends, and some of you may recognize him, recently retired, is the chef and founder of 18 Chefs. Some of you may have eaten at this uh, heart attack you know, meal. I would recommend it, but he's a joker. But he wrote one day in his um, Facebook post, he wrote that, uh, hmm, I still see the dragon in my sleep sometimes. The dragon, right? But he does not call out to me anymore because he knows I won't respond. Now, he's a joker. <laughs> but he mentions about the dragon, right? Of course, to heroin habit. But the fact that it lingers. Why? Because remember, I, saw, I, I showed you in the chart, it's in the present dimension. <laughs> Right, a future is coming where it will be removed, but for now, it's not. But that presence then is provided us the Holy Spirit's accompaniment. And um, he goes to uh, you know, quote this verse, which we are going to show now. He says this, Colossians chapter 3, verse 9 to 10. You have taken off your old self with his practices. Now, you, perhaps you cannot see the image clearly, but the image shows that it's taken off and now you put on. The putting on is not just words to say that you put on, but it is a habit. It is an action. And it's constant. It's not one time. You know, you, that is the struggle that we have right in the middle of the presence currently. The dimension that we are in now. However, the new self then is renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. So the renewal then is of a new thing that is so, you know, um, it's blessed by God because it's God's image in us. And that's where you know, sometimes we ask ourselves, what, what is new? The new is that I aspire to put it on. But it is a process. And that is the will part that we are talking about. You know, once more, it reminds us when Christ calls out to His disciples, there is a reason why He points out that term. Deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow. So once more, daily. And remember, linking on earlier when we talk about the fresh start effect in psychology, landmarks, new beginnings. So I'm proposing it's every day. It's in the morning. You know, someone asks, oh, why not at night? I said, no, in the morning. This is the first thing in the morning. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Right? In a little while, the theme of response will be there. The new mercies I see. Not clear is by faith. You know, while I was preparing for this uh, sermon, I was reminded, and it's so, I don't know where it came from, but in preparing, uh, I typically... I have a new habit since COVID came, so that was something good for me. And I learned from a few people. And actually, it was interesting because Adeline has been trying to get me to do it, but I say, yeah, 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 yeah. Until I heard my mentor share his practice, uh, one of uh, the prolific writers called John Maxwell. I am part of his uh, international team of uh, speakers and trainers. And he was sharing his habit he wakes up at 4.30 to write because he, he has written like 100 books. And he said, you don't write 100 books just like that. It's a practice. So I got, oh, okay, quite inspired. Then, of all things, I went to read uh, uh, an article about this 
Okay, I wouldn't say you want to follow him, but I thought it was interesting. Mark Walbert, if you know him, Mark Walbert. Uh, I kind of like look at him and say, wow, this guy has fantastic biceps. And how does he do it? Yeah, you all can. Uh, I only expire. But before I can expire, I expire. <laughs> can I, can then I see Mark Wahlberg's uh, daily routine. Go to bed, 7.30 p.m. Yeah, Wake up, 2.30 a.m. He's pushing in the gym. Put two hours in. And then spend quality time with his kids, sending them to school in the morning. 2.30, you know, 4.30, gets ready, get breakfast for them and all that. Wow, is it fantastic? Uh? I, I want to believe that. Uh. I'm not sure whether it's true, but okay, uh, sounds good, reasonable. Then I went to tell Adeline, my wife, I said, okay, tomorrow we start at 4.30. Huh? <laughs> and then about 8.30, I woke up. <laughs> then she said, what happened to you at 4.30? I said, wow, wow, the spirit is willing, huh? but the flesh is still under the blanket. <laughs> Until I got onto it. <laughs> but while I was preparing this sermon in the, in the about 5 a.m. every morning preparing, some thought came to my mind. I thought it was interesting. I wanted to share with this and I'll share with you the link. Morning by morning, New Mercy I see. It reminds me of a time many years ago when I was 19 years old or 18 years old actually. Where was I? Serving the army, right? In the, one of the uh, commander's course. That was very, very tough. We will wake up at about uh, 4 a.m., Right? And I remember that because in the bunk where we, where all the guys were at 4 a.m., we wake up. Oh, sorry, not we wake up. We never wake up at 4 a.m. We were awakened. Our sergeant would come and kick our butts, literally. With his boots come, he would just, you know, kick, kick, kick and all that. And then the first thing in the morning, we hear in the bunk, in the army, uh, all the Hokkien flowery language. You know, calling the grandfather, grandmother, whatever. <laughs> First thing in the morning, why? And I remember that because we had to go through like eight, nine weeks of it every day. No, is there a problem? Well, Mark Wahlberg, I mean, he wakes up at 2.30, what? But he sleeps at 7.30. You know what time we sleep? We sleep at 12. And we wake up at about 4. Four hours sleep, we got enough. Now, okay, nowadays, I, I, won't, I won't comment about army nowadays because I don't know. I heard it's quite uh, soft, but anyway, never mind. <laughs> Sorry, guys, but I heard, ah. Uh. So, 12, why are we sleeping at 12, sometimes 1 a.m.? I'll tell you why. Because the night before, I was polishing boots, my boots, my leather boots. Why? Because it got parade in the morning, and the commander said, I want your boots shining. When I pass there, I smile, I can see my teeth. And be like, Polish, 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 polish. And in those days, we had to iron our uniform until they can stand out. Can you imagine? And we are supposed to clean the toilet so dry, cannot use. Right? So, I was thinking, why, why we go through that? Then I realized something. It's called discipline. They wanted to instill in us, man, <laughs> discipline. So, NS is a very good thing. Uh. So, mothers, don't worry. Uh. Your boys will be men. <laughs> so, well, what is it got to do with this sermon? All right, so here, here's the link. The link is this. In the army, they spend so much money, taxpayers' money, right? Training our men. And then do these sort of stupid things. Sorry, oh, it's recorded. Oh, dear. <laughs> Two words for you. Too bad. <laughs> so, so, there's a discipline needed. Even though we don't like it, in the end, we all became very fit. It was the fittest time in my life. My fittest time. You know, at, at 4 a.m., we were waking up and all that. By 4.30, 5 a.m., we are running 5 k.m. in the morning. You know, and, and singing songs like in the early morning rain, how I miss my girlfriend so. That, you know, that kind of, just running, 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 running. But then we became fit. We became one unit. Right, because of the discipline that was instilled in us, although sometimes I question the methods, but the outcome was that we became one unit. Now that's the army. So here, two things to connect with today's sermon. Number one, we are in a battle. 
Remember the red zone? The present. We are in the battle. Battle requires discipline. What kind of disciplines are you putting on? So using psychology, fresh start. A fresh start is every morning. And my mentor, John Maxwell, says this, and I like it very much. He says, today matters. Why today matters? Today is the only time we have Think about it. It's too late for yesterday. You regret also, you won't come back. And we can't depend on tomorrow. Don't be too sure. You never know. So because you never know, right, then you know what you have now, which is today. Which is why today matters. Now, why the morning? Morning by morning, new mercies I see. You start your day you start your day praising God. You start your day thanking God for what's ahead. And you align your will with that. And therefore, every morning, every new today that God is giving you is a beginning. And so, I would um, strongly, strongly pray as we prepare for our hymn of response right now, to remember that today is a new beginning. God bless you all. Uh, is the mic on? So thank you, uh, Pastor John Tan, for the message. I, I, you know, when he talks about um, how the sergeant wake us up wee, wee hours in the morning and kick our butts and wake us up, and I was sitting there, I, I remember there was a time um, on one of the evening, we are supposed to sleep at, uh, what, by, by 10 o'clock? I think during the army time, when we, right? 10 o'clock. So I remember um, there was once uh, before I go to sleep and I will be going down on my knees and I, I pray to God and you know the, the bunk is dark and I will say oh dear Heavenly Father so I'm kneeling down and I'm praying oh dear Heavenly Father hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come and suddenly this force came from behind and whoosh, and I felt this force coming through my buttocks real hard so I turned around and there behold was my fellow sergeant and he called out to my name Kan Man Chong Samuel, what are you doing? Sergeant, I was just praying. Huh? You're praying? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please continue. And please ask your God to forgive me. <laughs> so even God continued to inspire us to pray, even when I was in the army. So uh, thank you so much. I'm very inspired by this message. So let's all stand as we sing the, the uh, closing song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy
us receive the Lord's benediction. May the Almighty God empower you as you go forth wherever you are at this moment into your places of interaction, of engaging, of fellowshipping, or wherever you are. May the sweet Spirit of God be with you and in you that you may share, share through your witness share through your blessings and more importantly share with them the news that Jesus is coming soon. In his name we pray. Amen.